This video is a continuation of Lecture 4b on Archaic Vase Painting. Having looked closely at examples of the black figure and red figure styles, I'd like to examine certain themes in Archaic Vase Painting as a whole in order to elucidate aspects of Greek society having to do with gender and sexuality, broadly around 500 BC. This discussion will depart from a stylistic study of archaic art, and in fact, incorporate some examples from the early classical period. Instead, it focuses on the ways that art enhances the understanding gained through textual evidence about gender roles and sexual practices in ancient Greece. As you'll see, there are a few reasons that make this discussion interesting and important. In part one of this lecture, I mentioned the symposium. I will now return to this topic to highlight some of the differences between male and female roles in society, as well as to discuss sexuality. Please note that the images on the right date from the classical rather than the archaic period, but they capture the quintessence of the symposium setting, namely the well-to-do men reclining on their clean eye, surrounded by male or female entertainers, servers, or other attendants, some of whom would be slaves. The woman playing the aulas, a wind instrument, may very well be a hetaira. Hetaira is a somewhat ambiguous term for scholars, but it refers to what might be considered an upper-tier prostitute. I've included here the Latin and Greek spellings of the word because, although the Latin is more common, you'll often see the Greek spelling in scholarly texts on ancient Greece. Both words also have optional irregular plurals, which I'll avoid now for the sake of clarity. Hetairas were probably analogous to what we'd call a courtesan, or even a mistress, in that they might achieve more wealth, have more exclusive clients, or even limit, at times, the number of men they associated with. Above all, connotatively, hetairas were meant to provide companionship and even intellectual stimulation in addition to sexual favors. In this way, they were different from the common brothel or street prostitutes known as pornai, whose commodity was just sex. Although prostitutes, slaves, or flute girls could also appear in symposium scenes, we often see hetairas. Kylixes, which we know are the drinking cups used at symposia, often have a surprise image for the drinker once he has finished his cup. These images can be humorous or bawdy, with sex scenes appearing more frequently in the late archaic period. Images of a drunk man standing by his companion who offers comfort as he vomits are particularly sardonic, considering the viewer has just finished a large cup of wine. But the reason Hetairas are there is because men wanted female company. Wives did not attend the symposia. Instead, these drinking parties took place in the men's quarters. Even the wife of the host remained sequestered in the female quarters of the home, unseen. The following quote paints a picture of the situation. We have courtesans for pleasure, concubines for the daily tending of the body, and wives in order to beget legitimate children and have a trustworthy guardian of what is at home. The pleasure in this quote refers, I think, more broadly to the pleasures of interacting with women, but with so many options there seems to be an embarrassment of riches for men, while leaving little to be desired with regard to the role of the wife. I'll talk more about what it means for respectable female citizens to be relegated to the role of legitimate childbearer later in this lecture, but first I want to stick with the symposia and talk about another possible consequence of this homosocial culture, where men often found themselves detached from the company of women. Here you see another quintessential symposium scene, this time in full color. This image really dates to the tail end of the Archaic, or Early Classical, period. It is a mural painting from Pestum, Italy, whose name we recognize as a thriving Greek colony from our architectural lecture, and it survived because it was preserved in the earth as part of a burial chamber. I don't want to dwell on the artwork at this time, although suffice it to say this is like a polychrome version of the Archaic vase painting we are familiar with. There is a heavy reliance on contour lines to articulate forms and no modeling. Profile heads prevail, even with frontal shoulders, and all forms are simplified. Of course, you see once again the men reclining on the typical clean eye. This often happened in pairs, or even three to a couch. But what's going on with the pair to the far right? That guy in the middle certainly seems to want to know. 
to cut to the chase, unless we're reading too much into the flushed cheeks, the caressing hand gesture on the back of the head, the proximity of the bare-chested bodies, it looks like a romantic encounter. Now it's true that you might see serving boys or entertainers in symposium scenes, just like we saw serving girls. And it's also true that the common female brothel prostitutes had a male counterpart, the pornos, for satisfying homosexual desires. But these two men are of the same social class, both reclining on the cleanie and partaking in the pleasures of the symposium. We can fairly assume that they are a kind of couple, and one particular visual clue suggests the acceptability or propriety of this coupling. Any idea what? It's the age difference. You'll notice that the men have beards of varying lengths, and these are age markers in ancient Greece. If we numbered these from one to five, with one being the youngest, it would probably look something like this. The youngest man is beardless. He's probably about 16 to 18 years old. The oldest man may be approaching 30, but the others still have beards that are coming in and are probably in their early to mid 20s. This is a convention you can use in all of Greek art to guess the approximate age of the subject. So, art tells us that there could be flirtation or even sexual activity between men at symposia, just as there could be between men and women. Before talking more about our understanding of Greek homosexual relationships, let me talk about its importance. It is a focus of scholarship, firstly because it's a rare place we find historical homosexual subjects at all. In fact, they are more prominently represented in Greek art than in almost any time up to the 20th century. But this disappearance of homosexuals in art from the Christian era until the incipient gay liberation movements of the late 19th and early 20th centuries fully reflects the effective suppression of homosexuals from society, and even their erasure from the historical record. In the late 19th century, Oscar Wilde called homosexuality the love that dare not speak its name. And legal records commonly circumvent naming homosexual acts by referring to abominations that cannot be named. Imagine, of all the horrible things human can do, this is the one. So we talk about the importance of this historical visibility in Greek culture because it provided a window towards acceptance in the West. When homosexuals were persecuted, prosecuted, or burned at the stake, voices clamoring for freedom and tolerance used Greek precedents to justify their tendencies. Since the Renaissance, antiquity has been revered in the West and scholars couldn't help but discover textual and visual references to homosexuality. This was mostly suppressed or ignored, but in these instances, the antique record was not expunged and interested parties, that's to say homosexuals, gained access and transmitted the information more openly amongst each other, thus establishing a kind of community that empowered them in the world at large. Interestingly, the prefix homos comes from ancient Greek, and funnily enough, you know from your biology that the term in Latin means man, as in homo sapiens. In any case, Greek art offers a wonderful opportunity to reintroduce into our scholarship and the knowledge we gain in our classrooms the history of same-sex love and relationships. We don't have a perfect understanding of homosexuality in ancient Greece, but before I advance some of the problems, I'll describe some of the apparent facts. The long and the short of it is that homosexuality seems to have been acceptable in ancient Greece, within, however, a somewhat restricted framework. As noted, some homosexually inclined men might be able to visit a pornos, or male prostitute, but same-sex relationships between men followed certain rules. Most importantly, older males pursued younger males. Here's why. Same-sex relations between two adult males in an egalitarian relationship were considered unseemly and unmanly. The duty of the adult male is to get married to a woman, but more importantly, he is culturally emasculated by being sexually receptive to other adult men. A true man must not only pursue, but take exclusively the penetrative role. A younger male can be pursued because he is not considered to be a fully grown man until he is about 20 years old. Relationships can occur between men very close in age if one is at the low end of older and the other is at the high end of younger, but there were often substantial age differences. 
Because of this age difference, male-male relationships in ancient Greece are typically referred to as pederastic, a word rarely used today, but one that has pejorative connotations. In its time, this codified pederastic structure, for aspects of it are literally encoded in the law, was all about preserving ideals of masculinity, and so even the younger man, when he has a future as a respectable male citizen, doesn't acquiesce easily, or fully, to his pursuer. First, the pursuer, called an erastis, must prove his worth. He seduces the younger male, called the eromenos, with gifts and often promises of mentorship or other leadership or guidance roles in a society where one benefits, as today, from who you know. Gifts range from the highly practical to sort of poetic expressions of love interest in the form of kylixes, which are particularly pertinent to the symposia we have been discussing. These kylixes offered to younger male objects of desire were inscribed with the word kalos, meaning handsome, and sometimes the specific name of the desired as well. Several examples from the late archaic period with Kalos inscriptions show pairings of bearded men with beardless younger men. Incidentally, the pursued boy's father is aware of this and might be happy to have a beautiful son that could attract such social benefits. However, the respectable boy must play hard to get, even when he is genuinely interested. Courtship also included more pointed physical or sexual advances. The older man typically caresses the adolescent's chin with one hand while fondling his genitals with the other. These are often in public settings in the sense that the pair is not alone in the vase paintings and you'll see other figures. You'll also see garlands, roosters, and other gift items in these types of courtship images. Incidentally, while heterosexual scenes outnumber homosexual sex scenes in general, there are more homosexual scenes of courtship than any type of courtship images of young women, which of course don't include nudity and genital fondling. Why do you suppose this is? Of course, official heterosexual relationships are geared toward marriage, and it's much more of an economic or social transaction. In fact, as throughout our long history in the West, the suitor is for the most part courting the father of his would-be bride. I'd also like to mention that girls could marry as early as age 14 and usually about 15 or 16, which is around the same age that boys could start to be courted by older males. A male often married at a much older age, and there are many reasons for this, which I'll discuss when we return to women later in the lecture. With so much effort and formalized effort put into the courtship, slowly but surely, the boy could be won over if he so chose. But full sexual consummation was not the prize. Anal and oral sex were forbidden, as these would kind of socially neuter the boy aspiring to be a respectable adult male. In fact, the boy's pleasure was, on the surface, limited to indulging the older male. The preferred method of sexual intercourse was intercrural, which means that one partner, here the older male, thrusts between the upper thighs of the receptive partner, here the younger male. One can't help but notice the emphasis on voluptuous thighs and butts in various depictions of nude males of the archaic period, and we should keep this in mind when we look at classical art as well. Let's be clear that history rarely records what went on behind closed doors, whether deliberately clandestine or not. What is mentioned in texts and depicted in art is what was culturally sanctioned, and it can hardly be a complete picture of the endless possibilities of human relationships or sexual activities. But to what extent should we consider any of these men to be homosexual or gay? This is probably a question we can't answer with great accuracy, but the academic consensus on the subject still runs contrary to common knowledge and might surprise you. For starters, the subject of Greek homosexuality was virtually taboo in academia before a heterosexual scholar named Dover broached it in the late 1970s, which coincides with the era of gay liberation. Dover essentially approached homosexuality as an activity, just another possibility for any sexual body rather than a distinctive inclination or preference. The fact that there is no scientific consensus today on the nature of same-sex attraction has permitted the academy to dismiss the idea of sexual orientation before the late 19th century as anachronistic. 
I find this mode of thinking to be highly flawed as well as prejudicial, but rather than sharing my counter-arguments here, I will instead acknowledge that most human beings could have sex with either men or women if circumstances, cultural or otherwise, compelled it. This is, for example, why there are so many instances of homosexual acts in gender-segregated environments, and I must contend with this aspect of the argument because Greece was a fairly homosocial society. However, it would be false to suggest that men never saw or interacted with women. Besides abundant access to female prostitutes, marriage was compulsory, and so segregation of the sexes cannot be the determining factor. All in all, just because the ancient Greeks sanctioned the option for homosexual relations of a certain kind does not mean everyone opted in, and we should also remember they did not sanction egalitarian relationships, or even commodified sexual relations between two adult men, even if there is evidence that, occasionally, the conventionally pederastic relationships resulted in lifelong bonds of some sort, and, on a related note, that grown men did take receptive roles and they, and others who didn't follow the rules, were ridiculed for effeminacy. Regardless, intuition tells us that not everyone desired the same thing equally, whether they even experienced it or not, and that the ancient Greeks understood there was a point on the continuum of desire where the balance tilted strongly one way or the other. But we needn't rely exclusively on intuition or even logic, for there is additional textual evidence from ancient Greece that supports the idea of sexual orientation, and I should share this with you. It brings us back full circle to the symposium. In addition to drinking, entertainment, and socializing, true philosophical discussions could take place at the symposia. In fact, you may know the word from Plato's famous text, simply titled The Symposium. In this work, the character Aristophanes describes how Eros was invented through an act of separation, a primordial separation of one being into two parts that want to reconnect. But the reconnection can no longer take place in a literal sense. Instead, it's through the act of love. Eros is the Greek word for love, or rather, one of the four words for four different types of love, specifically erotic or romantic love. Eros, or love, is personified as Aphrodite's son, whom the Romans called Cupid. This explanation for the nature of Eros, or human romantic love, is beautifully illustrated in the movie version of the Broadway play Hedwig, but you might imagine proto-humans of three types, hermaphroditic, male, or female. The hermaphrodites were separated into male and female halves, and their longing for one another is heterosexual. Likewise, the male and female entities were separated into two male or two female parts that want to reconnect, and both of these have homosexual longings. Although it would be unfair not to let you know that some scholars have dismissed this as a parody, it doesn't even have to be earnest for one to realize that the speaker takes for granted that his audience understands that there are different types of love, and the strongest argument made in the symposium to account for these diverging inclinations is that people are born that way that goes just as far, if not farther, than our current conception of homosexuality as a distinct preference and effectively slams the door shut on the argument that it would be anachronistic for us to believe that a Greek wouldn't share our understanding of the difference between a person who has a primarily same-sex attraction and another who has a primarily opposite-sex attraction. Before turning back to women, I want to mention that there's another place besides symposia that provides a hotbed of sexual tension and it will be much more familiar to us today. It is the gymnasium. The word gymnasium actually comes from the Greek word for nude, gymnos, and literally means something like the place where people are nude. There is a kylix by the carpenter painter dating to about 510 to 500 BC that shows bearded men on one side and adolescents on the other training in various familiar athletic activities with the usual musical accompaniment. But as we know, the kylixes often hold a little surprise image on the interior for when you've emptied your cup. What we get on this kylix's tondo is a picture of a younger male rather aggressively kissing an older male, a reversal of roles. But what I'd really like to draw your attention to is the juxtaposition of the very commonplace subject of athletics with a sexual one. At the risk of reading too much into it, the juxtaposition offers another valence to the nude athletic male body, that of an erotic object. 
This is an obvious conclusion, perhaps, and even Kenneth Clark, who was a pioneer of scholarship on the nudin art, admitted that it would be disingenuous to divorce eroticism from nudity, whether male or female, but nude male bodies are so ubiquitous in Greek art that we should not forget to imbue them with their proper meanings, sometimes their various layers of meanings. Following from earlier parts of this discussion, it's safe to say that athletic nudity at the gym cannot be automatically de-eroticized by the fact that the gym was an exclusively male environment. To state the obvious, some men are going to be into that. In our culture, this intrusion of homosexual men into an all-male environment can generate anxiety or homophobia, and the Greeks were not totally permissive either. Now, there is some textual evidence that some men of a certain inclination were maddeningly aroused by the sight of these fully exposed, beautiful male bodies, but these men were not granted free reign. In fact, the idea that such an environment could rouse sexual tension is reflected in laws that eventually separated males into groups by age in order to discourage even the one form of homosexual activity that was socially sanctioned, pederasty. Let's shift gears back to women. There are many reasons why it's difficult to make generalizations or to have a thorough understanding about the position of women. This is similar to the difficulties we face with all subcategories of gender and sexuality, and I'm repeating myself a bit, but drawing from the scholar Sam of Pomeroy here, the first reason is that we bring our own perspectives and prejudices. The second is that we're piecing together different types of evidence, visual, written, archeological, Third is that some of our best preserved textual evidence comes in the form of recorded laws. However, we well know that the law alone doesn't illuminate de facto practices. Think about how, unless we had statistics or criminal records, our laws in the books would tell us nothing about how many people were smoking marijuana before and after it was legalized. Additionally, women appear as characters in plays that have popular appeal and broad audiences, but they behave with respect to the playwright's goals, whether comedic or tragic, and either way are contrived to advance the plot. Finally, and perhaps more importantly, there are different practices between the various city-states at any given time. Athens and Sparta, the two most famous city-states of classical Greece, couldn't be more different. In Athens, females were barely allowed to be seen publicly at all, never mind seen in the nude, at the same time when male nudity was glorified. But in Sparta, which produced far less art and leaves less for us to talk about, females had more freedom. They appeared in public, they could own property, they could even have mutually consensual extramarital affairs, they could exercise in the nude, and they could view nude male athletes. But in addition to geography, time also makes it hard to generalize. Mores change from century to century, sometimes even decade to decade, just as we experience. I've been taking this moment in our archaic lecture to zoom in on these topics of gender and sexuality to bring the period to life and prepare us for future discussions on the representations of men and women through the classical and Hellenistic periods, but even my generalizations here are not static and are subject to problematization. Penelope, whom we discussed in lecture two, is an example of a virtuous wife. She fulfills her primary gender-appropriate functions of bearing children and weaving. She is also faithful to her husband Odysseus while he is lost at sea for a decade. But another virtue is her cleverness. Having promised to choose a suitor when she finishes the Shroud of Laertes, she weaves by day and unweaves the Shroud by night, and thus cunningly holds off her suitors for three years until Odysseus returns. The gynoceum or gynoceum was part of the house reserved for women. In an aristocratic home, it was where the wife supervised the slaves and herself did work like weaving and childcare along with them. Interiority is associated with class. Following from that, whiteness of skin is a marker of class for women since interiority obviously shields them from the sun. Out of the house, married women typically wore a veil to shield them from the immodest gazes of other men, or should I say shielded their husbands from having other men look at their wives. The veil was certainly a sign of class, but like being kept indoors, not a very liberating one. Earlier, I talked about the idea that girls often married as early as age 14, while men often married at a much older age. Aristotle said 37 was a good time for men to get married. There are many reasons for this. 
First of all, respectable girls should marry as virgins, even though males could be sexually active after puberty with non-citizen females or younger males in the context I described. Secondly, the age difference promotes a kind of female subservience to her husband, who certainly had more authority. On a more practical note, in terms of life expectancy averages, women predeceased men in some contexts by several years due to deaths in childbirth, and in fact, the most fertile and healthy childbearing years for a female are from when menstruation starts to about age 35, and a woman might bear five to six children at intervals of several years rather than back to back, so it didn't make sense for a woman to wait until her 20s to start creating a family. The amphora here offers an early and complete representation of an attic wedding. The bridal couple with the best man behind them sit in a cart drawn by two donkeys, followed by guests. In front of them, a woman leads with two torches, indicating that it is night. The procession heads towards the bridegroom's house where a woman, probably his mother, awaits. Interiority and early marriage weren't the only ways men dominated women. Women had little to no political power, including in the democracy that emerged in Athens at the end of the Archaic period, since only male citizens had the right to vote, never mind hold office. While we should acknowledge the stark imbalance in relative power and personal freedoms for men and women, we should also note that both men and women had social duties from which they could not respectably extricate themselves. The principal duty of both sexes is to the polis, or city-state. Every duty follows from that, and is the duty of the citizen, male or female. The principal duty of men is to serve as soldiers, administrators, or laborers. In Athens, which was a direct democracy, all male citizens also had political obligations. They did not elect representatives, but were required to serve directly in executive, legislative, and judiciary matters. Meanwhile, the principal duty of women is to produce legitimate heirs, or to be fair, I should say bear the legitimate heirs, since half the duty of producing depends on the man, even if he has a more ephemeral role in the production. But this childbearing duty for women is true even in Sparta. They may have had more freedom to exercise or sex around a bit more, but it was a different means to the same end. In the Spartan view, exercised female bodies make better childbearing bodies, and a technically illegitimate pregnancy is not such a bad thing, since it could still potentially produce another much-needed Spartan citizen soldier. These were their primary duties, but women were additionally expected to manage the household, including the young children. Perhaps we don't have quite enough information on the activities of lower class women, but there is a significant slave population in Athens, and there's a whole other layer of restrictions and freedoms that comes with it. Meanwhile, men enjoyed much more sexual freedom than respectable women, much more social freedom, more physical activity, and more education, as well as the exclusive right to political agency. Although, as I mentioned, the number of enfranchised men varies from territory to territory. They also engaged in warfare, and while this was more of an obligation than a choice for some men, and one that very often came with mortal consequences, thus stripping men of their ultimate liberty, the liberty of life, it would be fair to acknowledge that women could not join the military even by choice. The Greeks kept the mythical stories of the Amazons, a band of female warriors, in their traditions and in their art, just as they kept images of Athena as warrior goddess, but there was really no viable way for real women to emulate this. Lesbianism, also called Sapphism at certain periods of history, is named for Sappho of Lesbos, or to be more specific, for her well-known erotic poems on the subject of same-sex female love. The various biographical accounts of her life, written centuries later, when her lyric poems were included in anthologies, vary significantly, from casting her as a proper schoolmistress or priestess to a heterosexual nymphomaniac, a corrupting lesbian, or a prostitute. But the quality of her poems allowed her literary legacy to endure. The poems typically show women involved in religious rites and festivals, which speaks further on the roles and activities of women, but also engaged in private relationships with each other. Some of her poems were public. They were composed for girls to perform at festivals. Others were private and intended only for Sappho's circle of female friends. Her poems highlight the desirability of women in the pain of separation, perhaps when girls departed from marriage. 
They show a close association between young women on the verge of marriage and more mature women who served as their mentors and possibly lovers. This initiatory stage for females resembles the more discussed and better documented male mentor relationships, but the goals are different. Men are preparing younger males for war and leadership positions, while women are preparing younger females for marriage and motherhood. This may not sound very homoerotic, but keep in mind that women didn't have a choice. Even if they were true lesbians, women would have to support one another in their traditional roles with a male spouse. Of course, plenty of heterosexual poems praise women as well, and artwork does suggest that the beauty of women was a subject in and of itself. An attic red figure kylix from the late archaic period exemplifies the depictions of nude women bathing that emerged at this time. As we shall soon see when we study sculpture, female nudity was taboo. Even the vase painting we looked at, outside of intentional erotica, perfunctorily portrayed men in the nude while leaving women robed. But this was a reflection of real-life mores in Athens and most of Greece. Nonetheless, this image of a woman simply caught nude at her bath testifies to the appreciation of the female body as well. Turning to literature, one ancient Greek play offers a very amusing twist on the subject of male-female relations. That is Lysistrata by Aristophanes, and it's easy and fun to read. In this play, which dates the classical period, you hear references to the renowned beauty of Spartan women. For example, the Athenian Lysistrata and other women complement the Spartan Lampito's beauty, alluding not just to her delightful face, but to her freshness and her strength. Each time, Lampito replies that it's due to exercise. This view of Spartan women that conflates beauty with athleticism is upheld in other texts, such as the lyric poems of Alcman, who praises one woman's swiftness and endurance. There is a wealth of images depicting all kinds of heterosexual erotica right down through the Hellenistic period, and I'll leave you to explore just how explicit these images get on your own, if you so wish. But we might recall from the first half of the lecture that there is one instance where overt sexuality is completely unabashed and still acceptable. This is in images of non-human, but human-like creatures, such as satyrs, who are often shown as lusty fellows chasing after women. But we'll remember that satyrs even had erections while they were stomping grapes and preparing wine, so you can imagine what else they get up to in vase painting. In this way, sexuality is associated with the irrational and unbridled aspects of humanity, an aspect that is, in fact, still animal in nature. Accordingly, the mean ads that accompany Bacchus engage in Bacchanals, thus leaving them susceptible to those satyr advances, are considered to be crazy rather than in their right state of mind. All in all, there's probably more to say about gender and sexuality in the following centuries, and you can see that I've used images from the classical period already, and the best texts from Plato and Aristotle's philosophical writings to Aristophanes' comedies are from the classical period. And we have better records about Greek life from the Hellenistic period as well. But this very broad introductory overview focusing only somewhat on imagery and conventions from the late archaic period, should prepare us to deal with gender and sexuality directly in the artwork from later periods, rather than addressing it as its own topic per se in later lectures.